This is part 2 of my recap review on Nier Replicant version 1.22474487139. Video game. If you have not seen part 1 yet, go watch it first because I am not going to pad this already long video even longer with a last time recap. The link to part 1 is down in the description, and now I'm going to tell you about an extremist's adulthood. Five years have passed since our sister Yona was taken, Kaine was turned to stone, and our childhood ended. During that time, the Shades have begun to wear armor to protect themselves from the sunlight, and we have grown up from a young boy into a young man strong enough to carry bigger weapons. Meanwhile, Devola and Popola have not seemingly aged a day, which seems to explain how Popola's simp has been put into a good use. I decided a long time ago that Popola was too important and beautiful to worry about shades and the like. That's why I dedicated my life to protecting her. She trusts me to keep the library secure. So maybe someday she'll trust me with, uh, other things. False hope is better than no hope at all, I suppose. <laughs> While seeing Popola again and complimenting her back... Look at you. I think you've grown even taller. Yeah? It's hard for me to tell any, but you haven't changed a bit, Popola. What's your secret? I see your flattery skills are improving as well. No, it's true. You look the same as the day I first met you. <laughs> okay, now you're just embarrassing me. She gives us a letter from Emil about how he has spent the last five years researching that library report for a way how to undo Kaine's petrification. Now he has found something, and we go see that he found an underground research facility under his mansion, which makes that Resident Evil reference from part 1 a very accurate comparison. Fighting our way down deeper into his research facility with Emil following us, we end up discovering documents on a Project Snow White from 2025 and 2026, about two developed weapons, number 6 and number 7, otherwise known as Emil's twin sister Halua and... Emil is over millennia old! Emil is not a child, he's a... He's an over thousand year old human weapon. A weapon project result of human child who was turned into a weapon that doesn't age. What does that even mean? What am I? It appears he's trying to remember something. You're gonna be fine. Am I? Am I really? Your past makes no difference. We'll support you no matter what. At any rate, you would hardly be the first member of our merry band to have issues. And at the deepest depths of the facility, we discover what was originally Emil's twin sister Halua, with the sight of her making Emil remember his thousand year long life. I remember now. I remember everything. We used to be humans. Normal humans. Just a bunch of regular human kids like you'd see anywhere. And then we came here. They wanted to turn us into weapons. So they used magic to perform terrible experiments on us. Eventually they succeeded. They managed to create a perfect weapon. The name of that weapon was Number Six. But soon they lost control of Number Six, and the experiment was deemed a failure. They had to create a weapon that could petrify Number Six and seal it away. So they created me. I'm Number Seven. I'm... I'm a weapon. Weapon or no weapon, you're still a meal to us. Thank you. As his memories return to him, Emil's sister also awakens from her slumber and consumes Emil into her current form, which also happens to be the next boss fight where we can only use magic from Vice and not to use physical attacks as those could end up hurting Emil as well. <laughs> After the fight, Emil is shown to have connected with his sister in some kind of a dream state, before in reality we see them both to have fused into one being and looking at it, Emil is reacting to what he has become rather realistically. Welcome back, Emil. You've been through a lot. But my... my body... 
I can't stand to be with you when I look like this. We're here for you, no matter what. <laughs> Can you see my face? You... You look just like I thought you would. You look really cool. I think I'm okay now. And after Emil gets back on his feet, he lets us know he can now control the kind of magic that can unpetrify those turned into stone by his eyes. So naturally we go to restore Kaine at the library. We do need to fight against that shade locked into the basement for the last five years first. Which is not that hard anymore after we spent all that time level grinding. As Kaine is brought back to us, she mistakes us for her grandmother first before seeing and recognizing Emil in his new form, before looking at us as she used to look at us when we first became friends. And then after giving her a lunar tear we found, Devola and Popola come tell Kaine and Emil to get out of our village because the villagers fear them. They are okay at being ostracized, but we are not. And we even feel guilty at not realizing that Kaine used to sleep outside five years ago when we were too busy taking care of Yona. After sleeping on it in our own house, we calm down and go apologize to Devola and Popola. Hey. Oh, uh, hi. I kind of thought you'd never talk to us again. I understand you're doing this for the village, and that you don't have a choice. Pretty much, yeah. But look, why don't you go talk to Popola? I think she wanted to discuss the Shadow Lord with you. I'm headed there next. Oh, and Devola? Yeah? Sorry about yesterday. You don't need to apologize. Anyone would be upset when their friends are hurting. Let Emil and Kaine know that we're sorry, all right? All right. Popola? Oh, hello. Look, I want to apologize for yes- Stop. You didn't- Yeah, but neither did you. You're just trying to protect the villagers. It's very kind of you to say so. Regardless, please don't let it trouble you. Ahem. <clears throat> I believe there was something you wished to discuss with us. Oh, right. Yes, about that. You know about the Lost Shrine, right? The temple where I was first discovered. That's it. Well, it seems that the Shadow Lord's lair is connected to it somehow. So, while we were calming down during the night, Popola has been working on finding out that the Lost Shrine is connected to the Shadow Lord's castle. Naturally, as we want to rescue our sister, that is where we decide to head to next. And now, five years later, that canal has been fixed so we can take a boat there. And the ferryman operating that canal is the patriarch of that red bag couple we met five years ago. Hey, look who it is! Remember me? That red bag. I, my pages. You're the slovenly half of that couple who refused to stop arguing. Hey, it's been a while. Sure has. I've been in charge of this canal since we last talked. Apparently I did a pretty good job with it because they decided to make me the permanent ferryman. Oh yeah, huh? Congrats. Thanks. Still, it's not all puppies and unicorns. The old ball and chain is always harping on me now about how much I work. The red bag man gives us a ride to the Lost Shrine, with us picking up Kaine and Emil on the way there. As we climb our way inside the shrine and up the roof, we propose to join those two who are sleeping outside. But Emil says that he and Kaine are fine by themselves. You got a super important mission. You can't sleep out in the rain. What if you catch a cold? Besides, I like camping with Kaine. Sometimes we sit around the fire and tell stories or roast. Emil, that's enough. I got a fucking image to maintain. Eventually, we reach that room where we first met Vice, and look who is still here! We beat up Gretel, but not before he manages to fatally wound Kaine, which just makes us more determined to beat up Gretel. But once we do that and rush to her side, we are then reminded about Kaine being possessed by a shade, which now that she is vulnerable takes over, and now we have to fight against Kaine's body controlled by that shade. Use Vice's magic to do it, 
but mostly I should also point out that this fight also works as an interactive cutscene, where Kaine's health won't reach zero until the combat dialogue has reached the point where the story needs it to get. Once that has happened, Kaine is now back in charge of her own body and tries to tell us to leave her alone to prevent her from attacking us again. But Emil manages to change her mind with a speech about friendship. We're always going to be together, Kaine. If you transform again, we'll just stop it again. As many times as it takes. I don't care how tough it is. We're gonna get you back. I like sleeping outside because I'm with you, Kaine. I'm able to ignore my appearance and keep going because of you. I'm weak, and I'm sad, and I'm lonely, but you make me strong. You're my friend, and I need you, so don't you dare leave me! <laughs> All right. Stop crying. With Kaine's mind changed, our attention turned to the altar where we found Jonah sleeping captured five years ago, and in her place this time a magical force field along with a mysterious stone fragment, which we decided to take to Popola if she could figure out what it is. Popola, when shown it, recognizes it as a part of a five-piece lock, which should be able to unlock our way through that magical force field and into the Shadow Lord's castle, if we were able to find all the other pieces. The one we already found is called Stone Guardian, and the ones still needed to be found are Sacrifice, the Law of Robotics, the Memory Tree, and the Loyal Servers. Two of those more than likely referenced to the Junk Keep and the Forest of Myth, while the other two are probably best to be found while fighting Shades. If we want to fill in the words, we just run around the world killing every big monster we find, right? Oh, splendid. By all means, let us undertake a murderous rampage. They're just shades. Besides, it's the only way to reach the Shadow Lord. It's a dangerous task. Yeah, well, Yona's in even more danger. But how can you even be sure that she's... Because she is, right? The junk heap in the Forest of Myth, yeah? I'm on my way. Please be careful. In hopes of getting our weapons upgraded, we decide to head to the junk keep, where while entering, the game presents us with a flashback of the two brothers, and why we only end up finding Gideon alone running the place. At one point during those five years, the two went down to that level where their mother died in, and Gideon's too enthusiastic exploration caused Jacob to be buried under falling shelves. In denial and desperation, Gideon tried to pull Jacob out from under there, failed to do so, and then saw one big robot that set Gideon to blame it for his brother's death. And as we meet up with Gideon, notice how he has a prosthetic arm. Jacob! Jacob! No! Gideon does not know about giant shades that could help us, only that robot, and then he gives us a powerful but broken weapon to help us. Naturally, of course we need to go get some more materials to fix it, but then as a subversion of the video game tropes, Gideon tells us that he cannot have the weapon fixed just yet, and we need to wait one or two business days before we can come pick it up. Dying little bastards! Calm yourself. Haste will only lead you to making an ill-timed mistake. An unstable heart is the worst armor one can have. No time for that vice. Gotta get to Yona! After blowing off some steam, our next destination is the Forest of Myth, where once again we need to get through a text story or three with the sentient tree of the village. And this part of the game is pretty much a reading comprehension test, where we need to pick up ever-changing answers to questions asked after all the stories are told. The first story is about a sick child on a hospital bed who is visited by a girl who eventually stopped visiting him, and the different color of her eyes is the symbol of jealousy. The second story is about a female warrior in a war that happened a long time ago, and the ever-changing answer is the amount of companions she lost during the war. There is also a memory about the red dragon I brought up in the opening of part 1, but the sacred tree has to its shame gone and forgotten about it. 
Then eventually the tech story part becomes somewhat self-aware and I can only explain it with the visuals on the screen. But anyway, if you're playing this game, pay attention to the questions asked at this point and remember that visitor girl's eye color, the amount of fallen companions that warrior woman had, and that the most important person to you is Yona. That is how we get the memory tree key fragment. Then the game tells us to go see Popola, in case she has learned anything new, and she tells us that apparently the village of the Airy has suddenly opened up to invite outsiders to their new marketplace. The letter from the village chief also mentions the sacrifice key fragment, so of course we head over there next. I cannot fathom that village setting up a mercantile. They must have truly opened their minds. Yeah, I have my doubts. Aren't you glad to be going back home, Kaine? Home? The place is a shithole. Don't be so nervous, Kaine. We'll protect you. I got me taken care of. Worry about protecting yourself. Only to hear this from the chief himself. We came to ask about the letter you sent. Our days are numbered. Our village is doomed. As cheerful as ever, it seems. You're the one who wrote the letter, right? I... I don't know about any letter. What is going on here? It may be faster for us to take our inquiries elsewhere. Let us ask around. Someone must know something. With that suspicious dead end, we then decide to visit the marketplace and decide to ask if any of the locals would know about the sacrifice key fragment. Then we get asked about how we are hunting shades, and Vice responding to that causes this to happen. Here to hunt shades, are you? Indeed. Our aim is to defeat every last one. Everyone. 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 Vice! Beware, this man is a shade. It's a trap! They figured as much. They've been possessed somehow. Keep your guard up. Others are surely lurking nearby. In the chaos, it becomes difficult to tell which ones are villagers and which are shades disguised as the villagers. An extreme example of this comes when Kaine joins us and goes after a pair of siblings. Get out of here! No way! I'm not gonna abandon my own sister! Kaine, what's going on? Don't be fooled by this lady. She's a shade! <laughs> Back it. Your sister is one of them now. Care what she is. She's my sister. And I love her. Okay, long story short. More and more villagers get turned into shades. And as we keep killing those shades, they all converge into a huge ball that is the next boss fight we have here. It's best fought with magic, which is then where Emil becomes the MVP of the fight. A little too much. <sighs> Emil! Emil, wait! Emil! He's gone. His instincts have taken hold. The ultimate weapon is being deployed. for you, and I'll be dead. We owe you. But I... It's all right. <laughs> really? Don't look back. Yeah, yeah, what he said, and now I think we should probably leave the crime scene before the cops show up. Oh, look, the sacrifice key fragment. With two key fragments in our possession, any other reasonable person would probably lay low a couple of days, but that is what a guilty person would do. We act like nothing happened, and check up on our mail to learn that Gideon has managed to fix that weapon he wanted to give to us. So, while the cops are wondering what happened to the Eri, we head back to the junk keep to receive our weapon order. And Gideon does not ask much as our payment. I want you to avenge my brother. 
I don't care about money. I only care about making a weapon strong enough to kill those bastards. Which bastards? The ones in the mountain. That little Shade and his robot. A Shade has joined forces with a robot? There's a Shade in there? Yes. <sighs> and what have we decided, hmm? We're gonna kill it. With that reasonable request, we head down to the, into the junk keep to look for this Shade working with a robot. I've never heard of a Shade living with a machine. What's that about? Don't know, don't care. All that matters is that we kill them both. Ultimately, we find that robot and Shade working together. At one point, the robot ends up creating itself wings and flies up to attempt to tear the ceiling onto us. But when we finally defeat them, we end up witnessing something that makes me question if this was all worth it. You stupid machine! You killed my family! You took everything from me! <laughs> I did it! Now that this goddamn thing is dead, I can forage wherever I want! Just wait, you goddamn freak! Now I can make all kinds of powerful weapons! Just leave it to me! Leave it all to me! <laughs> Look, we get it, okay? Really? Hatred and madness will never heal a wounded heart. Maybe it's just all he's capable of right now. Revenge is a fool's errand. Yeah, I know. The only good thing about all this is that we also found the Law of Robotics key fragment. Not thinking about what happened at the Airy, we go back to Popoa to ask if she knows anything about the last key fragment loyal Cerberus, but she apparently is too busy figuring out what has happened to our ferryman. You know the ferryman with the red bag, right? Well, he's been skipping out on work lately. Can I ask you to go to Seafront and check on him? Sure thing. Looking for the ferryman leads us to go talk to his wife at the Seafront, who tells us that his brother works at our village as a gate guard, who then tells us that the ferryman agreed to help postman Hans at the seafront to deliver letters with his boat. So, after running back and forth to the post office at the seafront, we then learn that postman Hans has also gone AWOL to the crashed ship at the shore where we learned how to fish five years ago. What makes this part of the game mysterious and intriguing is that it was added to this 1.22474487139... version and was not in either versions of the original near. Also, Emil and Kaine, who usually stay back when we enter towns like Seafront, now join us in going to investigate the shipwreck. Up until Kaine suddenly starts to feel sick, so we need to go through the ship without her and Emil after all. This part of the game works pretty well like a slow burn horror game with tension being built to the deeper we go in. Catch glimpses of a girl in this wreck of a ship which... By my pages, this ship was used by slavers. How simply atrocious. Wait, you're telling me they sold people? And made out quite handsomely from the transactions, it would seem. How could they do something like that? I do not know, nor do I care to ponder it. Let it suffice to say there are monsters who trade coin for misery in all corners of this accursed world. Looks like a bunch of iron tools. Those are no mere tools, lad. They are instruments of torture. I shudder to think what evil transpired in this room. It was probably karma that caused this ship to get wrecked, and we hear its voice in the voice pipes that are connected to the captain's office, so we begin to make our way there. And then the floor breaks under us and we fall into the cargo hold full of dead people from the seafront, including the ferryman. Oh no, this can't be real. Why? Why did he... Why did everyone have to... God damn it! Pull yourself together, lad. Remember the presence Kaine sensed? The culprit who murdered these poor folk likely awaits us further within. I won't let them get away with this. As we climb our way out of the cargo hold, we find Emil and Kaine who have found another way inside, and then as a group go to the captain's office. 
On the way there, we also find crumbled pieces of paper with such a poor penmanship that even Vice cannot make sense of it. In the captain's office, we then find a young girl in a sailor dress and postman Hans who tries to explain that he has been trying to take care of the girl here. Oh, I've been coming here a lot lately. I think this girl was on the ship when it drifted in. I've been keeping an eye on her until she's well enough to leave. Hey, so this is kind of awkward, but the girl is, you know, bleeding? Well, how exactly does one deal with a woman's time of the month? So, sorry, sorry. Clearly crossed a line there. Forget I said anything. Kaine then points out that the girl is a shade, which now caught leads to a boss fight against her outside the ship. The lead up there is true suspense with these tentacles, and we try to escape the ship before the shade is revealed in this gargantuan form. Also, as a reminder, usually the shades cannot appear when the sun is out and only appear during a cloudy weather. To counter that, some shades in the second half of the game have begun to wear armor to shield themselves from the light which could disintegrate them. But this boss here has such a gargantuan size and mass that it can keep generating itself from both the sunlight as well as from the damage we try to do to it with Emil and Kaine. For the first stage of it, we fight on the deck of the ship with magic and melee attacks to the randomly appearing weak spots. The second stage is a magic only because melee attacks won't do much from the distance we are from it and the beach. Also, I will talk more about this part of the game in part 3, but here we are supposed to lose fighting against this boss by failing a quick timed attack. However, we survive thanks to postman Hans, who comes to tell the Shade to stop trying to kill us and call it a monster, which so demoralizes the Shade to let us shoot it with our last powerful attack, go face the sun at the sea, and let it slide, disintegrate, and die to sad music. This was like it was sad. Isn't it? A few days are skipped while we, Emil and Kaine, rest and recover at Postman Hans' workplace. Also, it takes however long we are resting for the ferryman's wife to come ask for her husband, of which I will again talk more about in part 3. We return home and report back to Popola what has happened. That poor ferryman used to tell me stories of the epic quarrels he had with his wife. He found the whole thing quite amusing. He loved her, though. He loved her with all that he was. Have you any new information about the key to the Shadow Lord's castle? Loyal Cerberus might refer to a dog, but I've never seen anything that would fit the bill. It must be pretty complicated if even you can't decode it. You're our last hope, so please keep trying, okay? I will. By the way, I was walking by your house earlier and I noticed you had some mail. You might want to check it out. Thanks. I'll do that. That mail Popola mentioned then turns out to be a wedding invitation from the King of Facade, whom we have not seen for five years. Thanks to a new ferryman, we get a boat ride to the desert zone leading up to Facade and run into some wolves on our way to the kingdom. Here. Does it not strike you as curious to find wolves in the desert? Should it? They normally live in forests, yes. Deserts would seem to hold little sustenance for them. Well, we can certainly guess what they've been eating. Anyway, once we arrive to Vassad, the king introduces us to his fiancée, who turns out to be Fyra. And even when it has been just five years, Fyra has grown a lot since we last saw her in matching the height of our main character, especially when she along with her would-be husband is supposed to be 15 years old. Also, also, did you know that in Japan where this game was made, the legal age of consent is 13. 
By the way, this wedding event happens to be the single moment in this game that acknowledged something that the localization team changed in both the 1.224744871392 version and in the 2010 Gestalt version with the father character. On the night before the wedding, our main character has a conversation with Emil, who is very excited about the next day and confesses that he wishes that he was in Fyra's place. I'm just so excited about the wedding that I can't settle down. I bet it's gonna have streamers and dancing and bears on unicycles and everything. I'm sort of jealous. I wish I was Fira. You'll find a nice bride someday, Emil. The main character responds back to Emil that he can probably find a nice bride for himself someday, confusing him a bit, before excusing Emil to go speak with the king. As Emil is left alone, he privately says, Yeah, that's not exactly it. And in the 2010 Gestalt version, Emil instead asked the father protagonist how his wedding to Jonas' mother was which the father dismisses as something that happened a long time ago and is not that important. Emil's private response is then that it is important to him, and the reason why is revealed in the original Japanese version, where Emil supposedly says that he wishes he could be the main character's bride. Meaning that this was the only scene in the entire game, which has to be played four to five times, where Emil was revealed to be gay and in love with the main character, but not brave enough to bring it up. Just enough to stay by his side and support him in trying to rescue Yona. Emil's outing as gay was done pretty much the same way how Bill was revealed to be gay in the original Last of Us, by not bringing any greater attention to it before the HBO Max show happened. So why have it been changed like this in the new version? This also carries over to another revelation about Kaine, which I will also talk more about in part 3, so I'll just leave it there for a moment and move on with the wedding. It does give us some respite from the tragedies we have gone through with the massacre at the Airy, enabling Gideon's obsession, and the death of the ferryman. So how about we add into that by having the wedding turn into a funeral? Remember those wolves from part 1 when we were first coming to Facade, and now when we are coming here again? They decide to attack the kingdom during the wedding, and of course Fyra has to be the only one who is killed by them. Fia! Fia! Fia, Sate! Kisarihiro! Kitasre! Kaisa! Kusa! The king is obviously outraged for being widowed this early into his marriage, and wants to avenge Fyra by going after the wolves. Vice and the king's advisor, however, tell him not to rush into it too fast, because the kingdom's defenses need to be solidified after this attack. The game also provides a chance to go do other things to prepare for the next boss fight. Story-wise, the king's advisor uses that time to gather enough soldiers to stand by the king after we choose to go kill the wolves. The fact that they are also led by a shade is extra motivation for us besides avenging Fyra. And those wolves go down way too easily before the shade leading them is the last wolf standing. We deal with it rather easily and then let the king deliver the finishing blow with Emil's despair playing during it making this come across as a sad death, which I will talk more about in part 3. Oh, and that got us the final key fragment, Loyal Cerberus. After paying our respects to Fyra at her grave and leaving the king alone to mourn her, we then return to Popola with Devola also accompanying her, 
as we show how we now have all the key fragments to enter the Shadow Lord's castle in the Lost Shrine. The whole village is buzzing, you know. They say you're gonna go rescue Yona. I'll bring her back. I promise. Um, about that. Yeah? Nothing. Never mind. Popola just loves to worry. Anyway, you be careful. Yes, do be careful. Thanks. And so we take the ferry to the Lost Shrine with Emil and Kaine, promising to each other that we make through this alive. When climbing into the Lost Shrine, however, the music in this dungeon is changed into snow in the summer from the beginning of the game, and it keeps escalating into a more intense composition as we make our way up there. Eventually we make our way into the hall where we first met Vice and fought against Hansel and Gretel, and use the key fragments to get through the force field blocking our way forward. First we are led into a garden, where the next lock blocking our way being two robotic pigeons that ask us three questions, which along with their answers open up some truths about this world we live in. Why did humans disappear from the world? Because of a black disease. How can humans extend their lives by separating body from soul? What is the destination of souls? They are placed in their corresponding shells. More about this later and in proper extent in part 3. Then in the next room we come across Devola and Popola who ask us to turn back. We are given a chance to do so, but as I have a game to play, I say that we go forward. We didn't want to fight you. I really didn't want to. Devil, what's happening? Sorry, but this fate was predetermined. Still, we spoke to truth. We really wanted to avoid this impossible. We were hoping to put it off for a hundred years or so. Until the next generation came along. What are you talking about? Are they shades? I don't think so. It's a lie! I don't believe it! We never thought you'd grow to be this powerful. This is madness. Why do you block our path? You have no cause to speak so with us, Grimoire Vice. You are a traitor. We are now forced to fight Devola and Popola, who are clearly holding themselves back as they eventually demonstrate by somehow draining magical powers out of Vice and start using it against us. Eventually they stop the fight, and cryptically state that the answers to our questions are answered once we reach the Shadow Lord, where they will be waiting for us as they leave. Entering the castle, we then find the locals, presumably those souls separated from their bodies, enjoying their own private festivities, but with our presence they turn into shades and force us to fight against them. While we fight, Kaine moves to break the door leading us forward open, which causes these shade orbs to pour into the room and use magic attacks on us. Naturally we fight back, and this causes one of the not yet slain shades to merge with them into a giant boar. Fighting against it is a fool's errand as its health bar keeps getting replenished every time we deplete it, so instead we have to run away from that shade deeper into the castle. Up these stairs and into another locked room, where we have to keep fighting a battle that goes nowhere until suddenly... Kasa, Teido to, Chi iru to te! What are you doing here? You are correct. Hey! Stop! Let me go! Stop it! Damn it! King, no! No! Open the door! You can't fight that thing on your own! You kuku! O Tauki! Aruta! Vieto! Kuruto! Ko! Chi! Iru! Open the damn door! Knock it off already. Let's go. Kaine! He's fighting for you. And for Fira. Don't let him die for nothing. My friend. 
After Kaine has slapped some sense into us in not making the king sacrifice thee in vain, we move forward into the castle to what looks like a modern day conference room where Devil and Popol are waiting for us. And now they are ready to hit us with the truth, of which I will also talk more in detail in part 3. 1300 years ago, aka between 2003 and 2053, the humanity was hit with a black disease, which brought them to the brink of extinction. In order to survive from it, the humanity undertook a last ditch rescue plan called Project Gestalt. The mention of the project name knocks Vice's memory, with Devola and Popola refreshing it with confidential documents explaining it, again in more detail in part 3, but I will do my best to cover it here for context. Project Gestalt was a plan to separate human souls from their deceased original bodies and place them into new artificial replicant shells. The separation process was successful, but replacing them into new bodies proved to be more complicated because of a glitch in the system, and during the time people overseeing Project Gestalt were trying to fix it, the replicant bodies ended up developing self-awareness and identities of their own. This so ended up making the original humans now as souls wandering around to develop stressed out tendencies and relapse into somewhat mindless behavior. Or in other words... <laughs> yeah, sometimes the truth can be a real bitch. You wanna finish that thought for him, sister? All of us. Every person standing in this room are mere shells created by the true humans. What are you saying? You still don't get it? You aren't human. So then humans, I mean, the true humans, are extinct? No, they still live on. You know them as shades. We are not humans. Our player character, our sister Yona, Kaine, and everyone we have come across in the game are those artificial replicant shells that developed sentience. The only one in the room with us that is the closest thing to a human being is Emil, but could you tell that from looking at him now? Even Devola and Popola are not humans, but rather they are ageless androids who have looked over us replicants in waiting for the day when Project Gestalt could get that glitch in their system fixed and place the human souls into them. AKA place the shades into their replicant bodies. As for the shade that is meant to go into our player character's body, if you have been paying attention, you'd have probably guessed it to be the Shadow Lord himself, whose original human form was that version of the player character we played early on in the prologue of the game set in 2053. He is the original Gestalt, or Shade, whose willpower to wait for his Jonas Shade to be reunited with her replicant has been keeping him from relapsing, and Project Gestalt has been using that willpower shared to other Shades to keep them from relapsing as well. But now is the time when we are meant to surrender our replicant body for the Shadow Lord to take over, and that leads to the next boss fight against Devola and Popola. By the way, I want to point out that Devola and Popola's movements in this fight are tied to the Song of the Ancient playing as it happens, with it pausing when the game is paused, and the twins are so not really fighting, they are dancing. Eventually when the health bar goes down, we get a cutscene where Devola is fatally wounded, with Popola rushing to her side as we stop fighting and she is dying. The cutscene is directed very emotionally with Emil's team playing during it, and when Devola dies in her sister's arm, Popola's mental breakdown is portrayed with aggressive conviction when our player character realizes we may have gone too far. <laughs> Let's stop this now. Stop? Stop? Now you want to stop? You think you have the luxury to stop? You cut down my sister like a goddamn animal and now you want to stop? Pull 
bubble of weight. It doesn't have to. No one stops. <laughs> it's way too late to stop. No one stops. <laughs> Please, don't do this, Popola. You and Devil were like parents to me. Those two have watched the world wither from time immemorial. The coolness of such a fate is difficult to imagine. I don't want to do this! I don't want to fight her! Stop bitching and start fighting! It's the only way! Popola at this point is too far gone, and when the blade fight is over, she unleashes a powerful self-destructive magic attack that Emil is just barely able to shield us from, but not save us from Popola's wrath in pulling us closer to her. <laughs> I fear we're done for. It'll be alright. Huh? When I was young, I... I hated my eyes. And now that I'm older, I hate what my body has become. But there's something else there now. Something like pride, you know? I mean, without all this, I couldn't have become your friend. Goodbye, my friends. Thank you for everything. For so long, all I could do was destroy. But now, I have a chance to save something. No! Now get going, okay? Emil! Don't worry about me. I'm gonna be fine. Emil! Emil! <sighs> Emil! You jackass, get back here! Help me! I hope they can hold it together once I'm gone. Well, I guess they'll just have to learn. I want to see you again. I want to see all of you again. Just one more time. I'm scared. I don't want to die. Emil's sacrifice is felt powerfully in the following scene with our main character and Kaine, who decides to use violence against us to express her pain while we just take it. Fun fact by the way, the game's original director Yoko Taro considers this to be the most romantic scene in the entire game, where while beating us up and holding us up against a wall, Kaine is supposed to realize that she has fallen in love with the main character, but due to her characterization cannot express herself in any other way than by stopping what she is doing. But now as we go deeper into the Shadow Lord's castle and come across more shades that we now know are human souls, that we have to kill to get them out of our way, some of them are children or child soldiers, who drop school books and coloring books. Eventually we reach the final room at the end of the long hallways and find Yona, who has visibly aged somewhat in her five years in captivity. But before reaching her, we have to face our Gestalt, aka the Shadow Lord as the final boss. But before that we have one more secretary fight against Grimoire Noir. <laughs> Okay, and then we get to fight the Shadow Lord in the final battle that lasts up until Yona suddenly wakes up and walks past us to the Shadow Lord in calling him her brother. Here we have a case of a Gestalt that has successfully been placed into its corresponding replicant shell, but probably because Yona is still mentally a little girl, she cannot comprehend her having replicant sentience coexisting inside her. There's another girl inside this body. I can hear her. She won't stop crying. She says she wants to see her brother. Yona's been possessed? It's not right, you know? It's not right that she can't see him. It's you. Isn't it? Yes. It's me. Let's go home. I'm sorry. I just... I don't know what to... I'm so very sorry. No matter what. Just 
not hurt me. I love you. Can you imagine having spent 1300 years looking after your sick loved one, waiting for her to be cured back to health, and the first thing she does when that is done is to kill herself? I would be pretty bummed out too, and the fact that our main character does not seem to acknowledge that by instead choosing to keep fighting makes him lose some sympathy points. So yeah, now we have to fight the Shadow Lord, who probably doesn't even have the will to live anymore. But before we can kill him, Vice suddenly begins to lose his strength to keep himself floating in the air. He explains this being due to us pushing him to use his magical powers up to their limit during the last five years, and probably because of what Devil and Popola did to him earlier. But as a true friend, Vice is going to use the reminder of his strength to immobilize the Shadow Lord so that we can kill him. You can't. I swore I'd always fight by your side. You are an exceedingly stubborn lad. You know that, yes. Perhaps that's why I've so enjoyed our time together. But I fear this is where our journey ends. Vice! Oh... And remember what I told you about using my full name. Well, forget it. I've grown rather fond of Vice. Vice. I knew you'd come around. Don't let it go to your head now. Vice has lost all of his power. Vice's soul fades away in taking away our ability to use his magic and making the Shadow Lord only able to keep us at bay with his own magic. Three hits in, and then we get a cutscene where the Shadow Lord has seemingly surrendered to his fate, and our main character seems to hesitate in recognizing that before finally delivering the killing blow. The Shadow Lord is so no more. And we return to Yona, who is being looked after by Kaine, and Vice's disembodied voice speaks to us in what little time he still has, in telling us how to wake Yona up. Here the game asks us questions in Yona's voice that only her brother would know, such as her favorite food, favorite book, favorite place, favorite flower, and finally we need to enter our player character's name to answer who her most beloved person is. So Yona wakes up, and Kaine gives us some privacy to have a proper reunion in telling us she has to leave to deal with what we have gone through by herself. This leads to the first of five endings this game has, and in part 3 I will tell you more about the other endings that come on New Game Plus. today. Yeah, it sure is. 